Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My name is Usama, and I serve as the resident chaplain here at Muslim Space. And thank you for all for joining us here today for our uh, Upholders of Justice Halakha series. Uh, this is our third halakha, alhamdulillah. Um, and we will be covering the topic of spiritual justice uh, and the inner struggle in Islam. And so just a quick background on Muslim space, and we'll dive into the halakha, and then we will have our esteemed speaker, uh, Chaplain Sundus, um, grace our space here. So just to uh, give a little bit of background, Muslim space, we are a community organization serving the greater Austin area. Uh, we strive to provide a open and inclusive environment for uh, self-identifying Muslims, as well as any who are connected to or may be interested in Islam or who wish to gather, unite, and support one another regardless of their faith. Uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic, we've aimed to make our events, uh, our events and our activities more accessible to folks outside of Austin. And we've had people join our activities from across the globe, and we hope to, inshallah, keep that going. And we make it a point to be an inclusive and welcoming community uh, where any and all are invited, regardless of their difference in faith, gender, sexual orientation, race, or any other difference. Uh, so just a little bit uh, about the series here. Um, there is a, a quote from uh, a Shi author, Sayyid Jafar Raza, uh, on the uh, author of The Essence of Islam, that I really feel gets at the crux of our series and what we try to accomplish here. And I'll just uh, read his quote um, from his book here. It says, if I am asked to summarize the nature of Islam and the principles of Islam in one word, I would say justice. Islam is synonymous with justice, justice to creator by having faith in him and by obeying his injunctions and mandate as he is justice, justice to the prophet of God on whom be peace by following him as he represents the authority of God on earth, justice to oneself by keeping it secure from sinfulness and egotism, justice to body by keeping it healthy and free from undue exertion and illness, justice to the soul by keeping it pure with piety, justice in the matrimonial sphere, justice to parents as they have been instrumental in gifting our existence, justice to the spouse who shares the burden of leading a family life, justice to the offspring as they are extensions of our own life by motivating them to take the right direction in life, justice to our neighbors by sharing with them in the moments of trial, justice to the sick by assisting them in restoring their health, justice to the downtrodden and the poor by supplementing their basic needs, justice to the motherland by enjoying the fragrance of its soul, by loving and promoting its prosperity, and by being ready to sacrifice for it, and justice to enti the entire humanity by contributing to its development, and lastly, justice to knowledge by making it reach far and wide. Justice, therefore, is the foundation of Islamic principles and occupies a place next to the oneness of God. For this specific halakha, we're going to be taking a look at what we can call that holistic inner spiritual justice, that uh, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that comes to mind when the Prophet ﷺ says uh, that we have returned from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad, uh, the jihad that is at home, the struggle of oneself in the community and uh, in the internal aspects. And so oftentimes when we think of this justice, especially in the context of world, uh, we think about it in the outward motions, fighting oppression, activism, and other really rich examples of what it means to be just and and what justice is manifested. Uh, but we see in Islam that uh, justice also is called upon us to happen in spaces uh, to ourselves and within ourselves. And so inshallah in this halakha, we can uh, dive into that a bit more. Um, and so it's my esteemed pleasure to introduce my friend, colleague, uh, and mentor in many aspects, and just a great friend all around, uh, Chaplain Sundus Khuluki. Uh, who is a hospital staff chaplain in Southern California. She earned a Master of Divinity in Islamic Chaplaincy from Bayan Islamic Graduate School. She's, a board she's board certified with the Association of Professional Chaplains, the APC, and she's author of the book, Musings of a Muslim Chaplain, and the co-editor of Mantle of Mercy, Islamic Chaplaincy in North America. And before I bring on 
uh, Chaplain Sundos, just a couple of uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, please, uh, first off, just remain muted. If you have any questions that come up at any point in the lecture, please put them in the chat. We'll keep note of them uh, for our Q&A time, which will happen at the end of Chaplain Sundos's halakha, um, or you can message them to me directly. Uh, and please, uh, up, uh, at uh, the utmost, keep discourse respectful um, for one another, as well as to our speaker. Um, we'll be having uh, an organization member on standby just to make sure our space remains safe and open uh, for this conversation. If there's any concerns, please don't hesitate to me message me directly. What I wanted to lift up before I invite Chaplain Sundos to the virtual stage is that uh, Chaplain Sundos has a book that uh, Dr. Omid Safi was holding up uh, just a little while back. Uh, it's uh, Musings of a Muslim Chaplain, as I mentioned. We will actually be doing a raffle for uh, several copies of Chaplain Sundus's book uh, for our attendees tonight. So uh, while you are here in the space, please be uh, please uh, please stick around. At random, I am going to raffle this, and at the end, inshallah, we will be announcing our raffle winners for Chaplain Sundus's book. So win-win. Um, uh, but Chaplain Sundus, enough about uh, the logistics and the nuts and bolts here. We would love to hear from you. So please uh, welcome to the stage here, and Jazakallah Khair for joining us. Thank you so much, Usama, and to Muslim Space for inviting me. This is truly um, such an honor to share this virtual space with you all, friends. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Good. Everyone can see. All right. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. I was really, really excited about this topic, spiritual justice. Um, and I think that for us in this room, as I'm, as I'm looking over and I recognize many of the names, many of us um, devote our lives to service, to some way of serving and giving care to uh, all of humanity. And as Chaplain Usama was uh, referencing at one point, there is a tendency for us to get so caught up in the service to others that we tend to neglect our own spiritual states and our, our spiritual selves. And so I really want to take some time tonight to focus on ourselves. So as I'm going through the halaqa and going through the slides, I invite you all to take the questions that I'm going to pose and just sit with them for a little bit and we'll do some reflection. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, Bismillah. So, okay. And this, all right. So, I have here uh, my goal tonight, inshallah. What I hope to do is to explore the concept of justice through a spiritual lens and specifically focusing on the beauty of our tradition and the ways in which it's designed to heal us to become the best version of ourselves. And Chaplain Usama referenced this beautiful hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, where he says the greatest jihad or the struggle is to battle your own soul, to fight the evil within yourself. So when I hear this phrase, spiritual justice, this, is, this too is what comes to mind for me, this hadith. And if we let the Prophet Sallallahu words of wisdom settle within us for just a moment, we can see how this manifests in our own life. So for example, isn't it easier for us to run task after task all day until we collapse exhausted on our beds at night? rather than sitting with ourselves and any pain or discomfort that we might be feeling for just 10 minutes? Isn't it easier for us to deal with an angry community member who feels unjustly treated than to quell the fire of anger in ourselves in a moment of personal injustice? And so while we work and we strive to attain justice by struggling against oppressive forces around us, there's also a side that needs to be balanced out. Work that fights the oppressive forces within us. And here you can see that I included an image of Dhul Fiqar. This is the sword, for those who are not familiar, the sword of Ali, the Prophet's cousin and son-in-law, radiallahu uh, anhu. And this sword is our scholars and our teachers and our sages, um, show us is actually a symbol of what I'm trying to talk about. It's this balance between fighting the external and the internal. 
So um, if you can see this sword, you know, if you can imagine using the sword while you are pointing the sword at the enemy out there externally, there's a part of the sword that also the other prong is pointing back at ourselves, at the enemy in here. And we know in the Quran that Allah Ta'ala says that Allah will not change the condition of a people as long as they do not change their state. So Allah will not change the condition of a people, the community, as long as they do not change their state. Why? Why is the improvement of the community dependent upon the improvement of each individual? When I think about this question, um, what comes to mind for me is that meme where one is brushing their teeth with Oreos. I hope you can see that from the picture. So what I mean by that is, while we might be doing these right actions, while we might be fighting for justice, while we might be doing caregiving, we might be doing acts of service, volunteer work, if these actions do not result in this cleansing and purification of self, how are we really removing the injustice in the world? So if we teach and we feed the homeless and we work at nonprofits and we counsel people and we pray and we fast and we do the kid, but we're dishonest and we're stingy and we're conniving and manipulative and mean, for whom are we really doing this work and why? So I'd like to offer tonight to look at this concept of injustice as imbalance, where one side is secured more access, more resources and more attention than the other side. So if we're thinking about this spiritually, injustice occurs when we pour our resources and our attention into one aspect of our being or doing and neglect to nourish the other aspect. And this really resonated for me because this is the way that I grew up. You know, alhamdulillah, I was born Muslim and I went to an Islamic school and I was in Islamic programming for most of my childhood. And this is the way that Islam was taught to me or how I received it at least. This emphasis on a lot of doing, a lot of points, a lot of rewards. And there was this side of Islam that was completely absent in my upbringing, which is one of reflection, which is one of pausing, which is one of letting marinate, which is one of being. So I grew up doing things. When I went to the youth group, join the youth group board, put on events, plan retreats, plan courses and classes and take them and study them. Um, you know, when we learn about the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu the way I learned it was through dates and names and battles and timelines. When we're learning about the religion and Islamic studies in my Islamic school, it's how do I make wudu? How many rak'at do I pray? What time do you pray them? How much Quran are you memorizing? How much are you accumulating in terms of knowledge? And then moving into college, it was a big shift of focus on activism. How many protests can we plan? How many marches can we do? How many courses can we put on? And while there's nothing inherently wrong about any of this, there's a spiritual injustice that I thought was happening that I was losing connection internally to Allah, despite all of that work. So we come back to the way of the Prophet Sallallahu where he entered Medina, upon entering Medina and upon establishing the first community there, one of the first things he said was, O oh people, spread salam, feed others, uphold the ties of kinship, and pray during the night when people are sleeping. And I find it notable that the Prophet Sallallahu recommends all of this doing, right? That's important. And then he ends it with this, pray during the night when people are sleeping. And we know that the prophet, peace be upon him, is very meticulous and very intentional with his words. So if we think about this, 
suggestion during the night when nobody's around, who's with us? We're left only with ourselves. And thus begins that greatest jihad, that greatest struggle, where it's just me and me. And I have to face those parts of me that are unhealed, that are scarred, that are raging. People will see our daylight heroic actions, but only Allah sees that internal state. So here we have almost like a formula that the Prophet is offering to us when we talk about spiritual justice or bringing things back into balance. In the Quran, Allah Ta'ala talks about us being a community justly balanced, ummatan wasatan, where the external is balanced by the internal. So we exist in this hustle culture, right? Where we just work and work and work until the point of burnout. And I wonder how many of us in this room tonight feel that we've reached or are dangerously close to reaching burnout. And subhanAllah, Allah and his messenger, peace be upon him, give us a blueprint to counter this sort of toxicity where ours is not merely a tradition of doing, but also very much of being. As a hospital chaplain, one of the questions that I'm asked very often is, how do I replenish from doing this sort of work, from carrying other people's grief all day? And what I've discovered is that I can't serve others. I cannot do the work that I do without the strong connection to my faith as that foundation and a strong connection to Allah and his messenger, peace be upon him. And through prayer and our traditions, other rituals, I both empty and then replenish myself. And this is a new learning for me, subhanAllah. As I mentioned before, this is not the way that I received Islam growing up. And it's only until recent, recently, upon beginning my journey in chaplaincy about five years ago, that I really began to learn and discover the healing modalities and the profound connections to healing through our tradition's rituals. Because as a chaplain, you really have to learn to sit with people and serve people despite the discomfort, despite the pain. And this proved really transformative for me internally in really mysterious ways. So it was in those hospital rooms sitting with people that I found myself experiencing God, not just reading about him and not just hearing about him, but really feeling him, experiencing him. And slowly I began to realize that our entire tradition is, is designed as such for us to have both experiential faith and this conceptualized faith. We read both the Quran as textual scripture, but we also are asked to read the signs around us in creation, that experienced faith. Secondly, I learned that our tradition is comprehensively a tradition of healing. So when I embarked on my research and reading on trauma and how to heal from crisis, I saw so many connections between what they offer as healing modalities right there in the daily rituals that we have in Islam from, from an attitude of gratitude um, to mind-body connection and salah to music therapy and Quran recitation, which is also called a shifa, a healing for us. Um, to somatic healing and the synchronized congregational prayer. And then I myself went through a very difficult trial during my early employment as a chaplain. And that's when I experienced firsthand the healing properties of this beautiful tradition, from salah to dhikr to exploring my own theology of suffering. And suddenly those practices that I merely checked off my list I needed very desperately as a bomb for my own broken heart. For the first time in my life, I couldn't wait in between prayers. I pray one prayer and couldn't wait to get to the next. And then I began to wonder how can we all begin to appreciate and see our tradition in this way as truly a way of life, as a blueprint for how to be rather than just a checklist of things to do.
And one of the ways I think about this is by taking a slightly different approach to our rituals. And this is what I'm going to cover tonight. Because Islam does not merely offer a coping mechanism whereby we find the answers to life's most difficult circumstances. Islam also offers us the exact tools and resources we need to make it through life's most difficult circumstances. Because Allah Ta'ala prescribes certain rituals for us because they're medicinal. It's a prescription because he knows that we need them. And yes, maybe we don't feel it in every prayer and every dhikr session and every fast. But what we're doing is we're setting up our muscle memory such that when we do fall into crisis, we automatically move into that posture and it becomes like second nature and then the medicine begins to heal. And this is why I feel so passionate about this work, about reconnecting us, all of us, to Islam's basic rituals, because those rituals that we compartmentalize are actually indispensable to our professional and personal growth. Through our five pillars, for example, we cultivate humility, presence, compassion, patience, and detachment. And all of these qualities are qualities that we need in order to serve others, in order to be able to do the work that we do on a daily basis, in order to create justice and establish just justice externally. So let's look at the five pillars as an example, as building blocks. And as we walk through each, pill, each of the pillars, I invite you to consider the ways in which each pillar works to prepare us for our work as activists or whatever work it is that you find yourself in. How do the pillars help us restore the balance between this external justice that we're pursuing and the internal justice that we need in order to equal things out? Years ago, a chaplain colleague of mine taught me a key insight into the Shahada, the, the declaration of faith that says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. There is no God but God, and the Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. Leaning in, he said, the shahada begins with a negation. La ilaha illallah. There is no God but God. One must empty oneself of what is in it to create space for what can be. In order for us to meet people where, the, where, they, are, where they are at, we have to leave behind our assumptions. We have to empty out our judgments so that we allow Allah to do the rest and to fill us up. To be able to witness, the shahada means to witness. To be able to witness requires intention and focus and humility. We cannot be present and offer deep listening to those whom we serve when we're filled with our own stuff. So we empty ourselves. Consider the times when we make the shahada, primarily when one becomes Muslim, right? We leave behind what we thought we believed in order to make room for tawheed, for that oneness. When we make wudu, afterwards we say the shahada. So first we purify through that washing to empty ourselves in preparation to fill up again in salah. And when we die, we say the shahada we empty, we prepare to leave behind this life and world in order to enter the next. And so in our work as community servants, how do we bring in the shahada in what we do? In what ways are we called to bear witness to the suffering and oppression of others? And in what ways do we bear witness to our own struggles and oppression? If I can only talk about Salah for 45 minutes, that wouldn't even be enough. This is one of my, I think one of the greatest secrets that we have in, in our tradition and our deen. Um, and I know I won't do it justice, but I'll try. So when we talk about Salah, the five ritual prayers um, that's prescribed for us, these are one of the prescriptions by Allah Ta'ala. When we think about it, we're really pouring out our worries and our concerns to Allah. It requires intention, it requires hudur, that active listening and being in full presence. And even if we think about the symbolism of the motions, the motions of Salah can serve as a method of breaking and cracking us open to receive the divine. 
our, our breaks for Salah at five points in the day, those aren't like bathroom breaks, right? Prayer is experiencing that connection to our maker. It's that connection, it's sleep. There's a sila, there's a connection to our maker. It's not a time for checking out, but rather a time for checking in five times a day. Rather than forgetting our worries, we bring our worries to this prayer space. We lift up our needs and our deepest concerns and our hopes and our fears to Allah Ta'ala. It's that place where we can bring our woundedness. And during my time, a personal crisis, this was my refuge five times a day, and I wish that it was more. And I find it notable that in Islam, the ritual prayer conversation with Allah is so sacred that out of respect, we have to hold ourselves in that hudur, in that full presence. Because our salah involves being with God rather than just doing on that checklist. Just as we as community servants aim to be with people versus just doing tasks for them. And for those of us who have been fortunate enough to pray behind a qarit or an imam with a really beautiful voice. And if you can think of a time or an experience where you've been praying behind somebody and they deliver the recitation from the heart and just so beautifully that our hearts seem to just kind of burst open and tears fill our eyes, whether we understand what's being said or not. That's the healing. There is a musical therapy, a music therapy element to it, yes, but there's also a metaphysical healing that happens that's beyond our understanding. When we think about zakah or almsgiving, the 2.5% of our wealth that we're called to give every year, right? We're emptying, we're removing a specific amount from our wealth. And the Quran often mentions zakah in tandem with salah, which is interesting because if you explore the connection between these two rituals, there, there's a breathtaking meaning that emerges here. So as we build a relationship with our human family through zakah, through supporting them in their, in their time of need, we're also building a relationship vertically with the Lord of that family. Zakah underscores the importance of the health of the wider community over the South. As our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu taught us that one should not eat to satisfaction when our neighbor is going hungry. And this is just one example of how this annual ritual carries so much significance beyond just giving charity. Because as we serve others, how are we too served and purified and emptied and ready for more service? When we consider the meaning of the Arabic word zakah, that which purifies, the Islamic spiritual refinement process known as, known as tezkia comes to mind. And this is a practice of purification of one's heart. And if we neglect this practice, that is rooted in self-assessment and self-awareness and muhasaba and taking note of our state, we risk putting ourselves in a place of self-contentment or worse arrogance, where we think, or our ego makes us think that people need us to do this work. People need us to heal when it's really Allah who's doing the healing, Allah who's doing the, the alleviation of oppression and suffering, it's not really us. When we think about psalm, or fasting, the pillar of fasting, especially in the month of Ramadan, again, emptying our stomachs, emptying our, our lower selves during those daylight hours, mirrors this practice that we need to do as caregivers, as volunteers, as activists, to empty ourselves of our own distractions so that we can hold space for others. And even this idea of hunger, while we're fasting, we notice that we slow down, right? We slow down during the day because we don't have that constant fuel and coffee and adrenaline running through us. And when we slow down, we suddenly notice things about ourselves and from within ourselves that we wouldn't have noticed before. And so we start to heal from the inward out. And what I'll say lastly about fasting is that as activists and as volunteers and spiritual caregivers, this pillar actually teaches us or invites this personal aim of setting boundaries and limits. 
because many community servants struggle with this idea of this ethical practice of boundary setting because we just want to keep loving and serving and loving and serving and often to our own detriment. But what fasting does is it helps prove to ourselves that we can indeed exercise control and choice and agency over our situation, especially when we're doing it for the goal of uh, a higher goal of spiritual aim. And lastly, hajj and pilgrimage, the symbolism of leaving behind our homes and our comforts merely for the sake of Allah. And for this one, I think of the state of Ihram, that one of the first things that we do when we embark on the Hajj pilgrimage is that we, we enter into this state of ritual sanctity and that where this inward state of Ihram requires a commitment from all pilgrims to do no harm, where we, we don't even cut our own fingernails or hair, we don't step on anything or kill any animals or anything like that. And observing Ihram necessitates a diligent self-awareness or muraqaba, where we guard our actions, our words, and our intentions to be able to fulfill this commitment of do no harm. And I wonder if we practice the state of ihram just for a few hours every day, if we can exercise this muscle such that it doesn't exhaust us so quickly to observe and uphold other people's dignity and their sacredness and their sanctity. So with these, we've only scratched the surface of this ocean of symbolism and refinement of our deen, of our traditions, rituals, all meant to help empty ourselves of ourselves, to make room for Allah, to make room for the divine and his creation, and also meant to augment our own personal healing. And this is when we bring into balance this concept of spiritual justice, when we can use our service and our work as part of our own self-refinement because we serve in order to be changed from within. Allah prescribes these rituals for a reason. And ultimately, again, they benefit our inward state and again, prepare us for our work in the here and now. If fasting doesn't help us develop willpower and delayed self-gratification, we're doing it wrong. If pilgrimage doesn't help us detach from our daily comforts and self, we're doing it wrong. If prayer doesn't help us trust in Allah and in his control over matters, we're doing it wrong. And if almsgiving doesn't help us realize that our human race is interdependent and that we will sink without each other, we're doing it wrong. Religious ritual was prescribed to strengthen our spirituality, not replace it. So we are the people of alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat. We have this belief, we believe, and we work. We be, and we do. Again, bringing this balance back, restoring the balance. I remember early on, I was asked by a teacher this really profound question, why do you serve? Why do you volunteer? And it was with a room of, of other people and we were taking a class on how to be community servants or how to, how to serve people. And all, all many of us in the room gave very different answers. And he kept pushing us and saying, but why, but why, but why? Really getting down to the core. And I invite you to think of this question and consider this question right now. Why do you serve? in whatever volunteer or service capacity that you're in, why do you do it? We may have many reasons, many different reasons why we serve, but ultimately, ultimately, fundamentally, we serve to grow cl closer to Allah by growing closer to his creation. And service, interestingly, is one of the fastest ways that we can arrive to God. I, I don't dare speak about our beloved Rumi with um, our dear teacher, Dr. Safi in the room, but I will mention that the students of Rumi, before they were even allowed to sit in the majlis with him, they had to work in the kitchen for a minimum of two years before they could even start learning. If we think about this, what is that service work preparing them for? 
there's a beautiful poem uh, in, in Urdu, and I'll translate this line where it says, through worship, you attain paradise. Through service, you attain God. So if we are in a capacity where we can serve others, where we are doing volunteer work, this is a gift from Allah to us. It's an invitation because this khidma, this service, this love to and service of others, love of and service to others rather, rather just like students of Rumi who wanted to sit and learn at his feet, had to wash dishes for two years and work in the kitchen. It serves to break down our ego and humble us. It teaches us to put others before ourselves and our own needs. And through this humbling of the ego, the jihad and nafs, this in turn purifies our hearts of any misunderstandings that people need us. Because really the refined attitude, the refined self says and believes, I believe God brought you to my doorstep. Anybody who comes throughout our day asking us for help or needing a minute of our time or more than a minute, an hour, a couple of hours, needs resources from us. When we reach this refinement of the self, instead of feeling angry or irritated or burdened, it's this idea of Allah brought you to my doorstep begin to see the reflection of God, of the creator and every created being. And when we think we're doing other people a favor, in reality, the people we're serving, they're the ones who are doing us the favor by supporting this alchemical transformational process where again, we see this cycle of love, us, love of and service to others translating into this humility and this humbling of the self, the ego, and turning into refinement and helping us see the best in people and to be able to love them. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. I pray and I'll pause here for discussion and question and answer and also reflections. I'm really eager to hear as we were going through the pillars if anything surfaced for you that wasn't mentioned that has really been working for you, um, that you feel has been indispensable to your line of work. I'd love to hear it as well. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll end my portion with a short du'a. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, I pray that you accept from us, that you forgive us. La Allah, you make us your sincere servants to the most gentle and beautiful of means that you help us reach this purified state, that you help us reach this humbled and sincere state, Ya Allah, by the most gentle and beautiful means, that you work through us in order to support and love and serve your creation, and in doing so, grow closer to you and your beloved Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi So I will stop sharing here and open it up discussion um, for that just very insightful and beautiful presentation i think just to have, uh, how you put it we're just scratching the surface and i think that you, you you've uncovered quite a well um for us to to just dive into um I, I did receive a few questions here um directly so we can definitely get to those before i do i'm just going to post in the uh chat here uh, the winners of our raffle, and we will touch base with Yay. you via email um, for uh, Chaplain Sundus's book. So uh, let me go ahead and drop those names here in the chat. Uh, so if you see your name there, uh, you are one of our winners of our raffle, alhamdulillah. Uh, we will contact you directly um, after the event, uh, and you will uh, get a copy of Chaplain Sundus's book. <laughs> Uh, awesome. So, um, uh, Sundus, uh, as, as uh, Chaplain Sundus had mentioned, um, you know, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, drop in your questions. Um, just for the sake of uh, audio and clarity, uh, we would love to just keep um, the questions in the chat, and then we can um, we can you know uh, field them to Chaplain Sundus. But uh, one of the first questions that I was sent here, um, as you were kind of reflecting 
um, really beautifully, especially on the five pillars, was someone had asked uh, for you, Chaplain Sundos, uh, what, uh, what in your life or what in your vocation and profession uh, evoked this, um, this call of faith to look to look at uh, justice, to look at our, our, um, the work that we do, not so much from the outside, but also from the inside out. Um, where where did, uh, did that click for you at some point in your life? How did that come about for you? And what advice do you have for those of us who are still trying to connect to our faith, um, uh, especially from the external, but having trouble to do so with the internal? That's a great question. I alluded to it a little bit, but I suppose I didn't really flesh it out. Um, it really was my my line of work that I do currently as a hospital chaplain, um, where I have the immense privilege and honor of spending time with people in the most uh, raw state they might find themselves in, in, in moments of crisis, in moments between life and death, um, in those breaths between life and death. And what I learned from sitting with people of all faiths and no faith is how they connect to, to the divine, how they interpret the divine. Um, and really many of them are serve as my teachers. And so what I saw was the importance of ritual, for example, and helping us move from one point to another and really began to read into our faith or, or rather when I was reading material and books and articles about trauma, about crisis, and how people use religion and spirituality as one of the top coping mechanisms, and really understanding why that is, bringing that back to our faith and shining kind of a new light on it. One of the things that really helped me that I, that I speak about often is that returning to the Sira of the Prophet, the biography of the Prophet, so I send them peace be upon him, and reading about the ways in which he was sat with people how he was present with people, um, how, he, how he brought people in, how he comforted them, how he held space for them. And these stories were never surfaced during my childhood. These were stories that I didn't hear before, that I couldn't come up with you know, off the top of my head, that I really had to study anew. And the more that I began to read about the Prophet them in this way, and attach this to his moniker as rahmatan min alameen, as mercy to all of mankind, and then further attaching that to this, the beautiful names of Allah, ar rahman and rahim I suddenly began to see the tradition in a whole new way. Um, when you look at many practices that are, that are suggested right now in terms of scientific, scientifically based or scientifically proven exercises, such as mindfulness, meditation, um, these, these modalities of just being and sitting. It occurred to me that these things are not new for us as Muslims. I've actually been doing this almost all my life, but it's like a light switch was just suddenly turned on. Of, oh, that's what Salah is supposed to be like. Oh, I'm supposed to be. It's not just about reciting and keeping track of the rakahs, but what would happen if I approached the prayer rug and had this visual that I had brought up on one of my slides of like all of the black thick that I'm feeling inside of me right now. What if when I tip over and sujud and rukua and sujud, that I just let all of that out? And we know that sujood is one of the most potent parts of salah, right? When our forehead, the highest point of our body, touches the lowest point, that we're literally grounded. When we talk about grounding, there are all these buzzwords, right, that we, that we have, especially here in healthcare and in healing and this holistic being. Um, we have so much of that. And, and it really renewed my appreciation for this tradition. Um, and I really suddenly felt very passionate about trying when I discovered these connections that I wanted to bring these connections and surface them for, for my Muslim friends and peers. And I remember one time I wrote about this in the book, I was with a group of um, peers my age and they were all kind of comparing apps on their phone where it was about you know mindfulness and meditation apps. And I said, well, mine reminds me to check in you know, like twice a day and mine reminds me to check in three times a day. And they turned to me and they're like, well, what app do you use? And I'm like, it's called the Adan. <laughs> and it reminds me to check in five times a day. 
Um, so one up. But, um, but the, you know, like, and I wonder if we repackage some of these rituals and our pillars and kind of like these buzzwords, would they, would they hit differently? Would they resonate different, differently with our generation? Um, and the second part of that question, because I rambled, I forgot. So Sam, please remind me. Sure. Um, the second part, uh, let me, sorry, I was just scrolling here. Okay. Uh, take a look here. Um, for the, for, for, um, oh, for folks the practical. Who, yeah, for, for practical, like what, what can those who especially maybe connecting with the outward of their faith, um, mm -hmm. you know, but struggle to connect with the inward, how can they uh, turn that inside out? What, what can they do to uh, help with that? I really should not be answering any of these questions. There's certain, some expert in the room, but um, I would say that um, again, through my line of work, I, I really began to discover that what nourishes me, what is my spiritual love language is not necessarily what others would find nourishing and helpful, um, which is why I think there's much wisdom in the fact that Allah Ta'ala gives us five plus, five pillars plus all these other rituals that we have at our uh, disposal for us to be able to almost try everything out. And we find that with different seasons, we might connect differently. Um, and that we might need different tools at different times, subhanAllah. But I would say just on common ground, if anyone is looking to strengthen strengthen their, their spiritual connection, their spirituality, number one, first and foremost, is, is the gratitude piece. Um, practicing gratitude daily. And this is not um, this is not unfamiliar to us as Muslims because we start it, we say it at least 17 times a day. When we start every rakah with salah, we say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. The first line of the Fatiha begins with this praise and gratitude. Um, so again, if we're looking closely at these, these beautiful and special prayers that we're asked to, to do and prescribed, we can begin to see why they're being prescribed. So number one is, is gratitude, practicing gratitude. Um, number two, I would say salah itself that there's a reason why we're asked to do it a certain number of times a day. Um, even if you can't make all five, just try to do one because there's so much healing, even scientifically based in, in, the, in the postures that we have, the mind and body, and I would say soul connection. Um, there's, there's reason that there's movement to it. There's a cadence, there's the Quran recitation. Um, so I would say gratitude, um, doing salah as much as possible. And the third one would be getting outside of our buildings and rooms and spending some time in nature. Um, because as we know, the Quran tells us that everything in creation is making dhikr of Allah. So what better companionship to have than to sit among the trees and these live grass and flowers and birds and animals, and uh, and there's a healing in that too, subhanAllah. Um, so I would say just across the board, even though all of us speak different spiritual love languages, those are three that we can begin to practice and implement uh, on a daily basis, and hopefully that will help us to connect. So I have some just appreciate you answering that. Um, we've got a few more questions dropping here. Again, just a mindful of time uh, for everybody here, just to respect uh, Chaplain Sundas' time and for your all time. Uh, we'll be, inshallah, concluding at eight o'clock central, uh, so in about 10 minutes, but we've got some questions here, so definitely want to prioritize those. Um, well, here's a question, uh, Sundus, for you. My questions are related, and they are, how do the lessons that you've mentioned here differ or are similar with one person and their relationship with Allah as compared to uh, as compared uh, to with the companion, with the notion of half of our deen, then marriage in Islam is supposed to be a big part uh, of an individual's spiritual development. As such, how does what you've said about spiritual development advance with the companion versus as an individual? Let me make sure I'm understanding the question. Um, when uh, this individual is asking, how does the fulfillment of marriage and that completion of half our deen compared to the individual struggle with 
can you rephrase the question <laughs> or if anybody, if somebody can clarify it. Sure. And, 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 and uh, he had mentioned that if, uh, if you'd like, you can come out and, uh, you know, verbally mention it in case it didn't get lost in translation. Uh, Tabrez, would you like to um, uh, come off the mic and ask the question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you very much. It's very helpful and insightful. Um, my questions uh, are related, and I think I uh, can word it more succinctly. I wrote it out in much depth, but essentially I'm wondering what everything that you've said, how it relates in an individual relationship versus with a companion. Like, is everything you said differ or similar uh, in your view? And what then does the companionship relationship add if it's if it's you know half our dean it's so it emphasized in islam and so like how do you compare that in in the lessons you've shared thank you very much yeah thank you Tabriz. um a lot of what i talked about is on an individual level right this individual purification this individual focus um and certainly when we have a righteous companion to be able to do it with to support us through it to remind us um, this is also a gift and a blessing. Um, but ultimately, as we know in our faith, each person is accountable for their own selves, for their own soul. Um, not all of us are uh, blessed or, or privileged or gifted with a companion, first and foremost, let alone a righteous companion. Um, there are those of us who might be single, who might be divorced, uh, or who might be, be in marriages where the other person is a, at a different stage of faith. Um, and so while for those of us who find ourselves in companionships and marriages and, and relationships where we can uphold one another and be able to support each other in this way, um, I think really it goes back to our individual relationship with Allah Ta'ala and strengthening that no matter what. Because as we know, this dunya is finite and everything within it is finite. Relationships are finite. Um, people come and go. And what lasts and what is everlasting is Allah Ta'ala. Um, and so I would say, you know, things maybe don't change per se, um, but it's really nice to have somebody to help you through that and to be a reminder for you to wake you up for vision and, and help walk the path with you. To walk the path with a companion, I think is really, really helpful. Um, but again, you don't necessarily have to be in a romantic relationship to have companions or sahaba um, on this path that we're treading. And if we find ourselves completely alone, we know that we have the ultimate companion, the capital C, that we are actually never alone, um, and that he will fulfill our needs and trouble. I hope that answers the question, please. Sakla, uh, Sundas, for that beautiful answer. I think it uh, connects really well to this next question um, that was asked uh, that says, uh, dhikr may be a prominent uh, component of our of one's own spirituality, but how does uh, dhikr inform slash influence your introspection? How do you create this sacred space of connection with Allah, especially when you feel guilty or feel a some sort of guilt? Mm. A lot of these questions uh, necessitate much longer conversations. I think uh, as a chaplain, I don't, I feel like I don't do justice with these sound bites. Uh, it really deserves its own conversation. Um, when you're feeling a lot of guilt. You know, there's a beautiful saying by one of our, our saints in Islam, um, Ibn Atta'illah Skandal, his aphorism about Dika that I revisit quite often, where somebody, I think, asked him, you know, what's, why should I do the good if I'm not there mentally? Um, I'm doing the physical act, but my brain is elsewhere. I'm distracted. I may be feeling all these other feelings. I'm not really focusing on what's being said. So is it really, should I even be doing it? And what he answered, and I will paraphrase, is basically, to be heedless in the thicket or to be distracted in the thicket is better than to be heedless or distracted outside of the thicket. That perhaps Allah will elevate you and raise you from heedlessness to mindfulness and from mindfulness to full presence and full presence to the point where everything that you are hearing and seeing and experiencing is Allah Ta'ala. 
And so I would say whatever emotion is surfacing for us, whether it's guilt, whether it's shame, whether it's regret, that, you know, in, in each one of these beads, there's an opportunity um, to empty out, right? When we talk about this theme of emptying, to take each one of these beads and empty it out and pour it into that, they could select an affirmation that will, um, or a thicket or an affirmation, I'll call it, that will juxtapose or balance out the guilt and the shame. And there are many that you, know, you can um, search from. Um, but I would say these, you know, this was my lifeline personally when I was going through my own challenge and there's so much healing involved in it. Um, and then I learned from another, from, from a teacher of mine, it's like, why do we do it 99 times, for example? Why do we do it 100 times, 200 times, 300 times? And the answer is beautiful is that out of those 99 or 100 times, perhaps just one of them was made so sincerely from the heart. And that's the one that will make all the difference and that will switch our state, will elevate us, will, will take us to that next level, will, will get us that reward or that healing. That we need. Um, so I would say keep, keep doing it, um, bring whatever, bring everything to it. And inshallah, you know, through Allah and through his healing, um, that will be addressed. Sandos for that uh, for that beautiful answer. Um, I think we'll just have time for one or two other questions here. Uh, this uh, other question here says, do you have any reflections on helping Muslims heal from religious trauma? Yes. <laughs> I do. Um, uh, I'm going to sound really... Um, What, what am I? Am I millennially? I'm a millennially. Um, I, I actually co-wrote um, a post on this um, recovering from, from religious abuse or spiritual abuse. Um, and you can, you can find it on my, um, my Facebook or Instagram page. I'm sorry to plug this. It feels very strange. But um, I, I did it in collaboration with, uh, with a uh, mental health professional and also uh, another spiritual guide and uh, both who, of whom are women and the three of us have experienced um, spiritual abuse at the hand of the hands of people who um, present themselves as spiritual leaders and so uh, this one was very personal for me so inshallah I can link that for um, Osama and he can send it out um, but that one has uh, quite a few steps there and some suggestions that I invite you to take a look. So thank you, Sundos. And yeah, wh whatever you uh, send us and resources and links, we'll be sure to email it to all of our attendees, inshallah, those in the space here and those who may view it for time to come. Uh, the last question here um, comes from a former Halakha speaker of uh, <laughs> Upholders of Justice. Uh, Dr. Safi uh, asks, Chaplain Sundos, in your beautiful book, you have this powerful quote about how we need to move, on, move from talking heads to listening hearts. Do you have practices that you might recommend to us to, for culti uh, for, uh, to cultivate this sense of being and becoming a listening heart? And God bless you again and again. And I thoroughly endorse that as well. I mean, I mean to bless us all again and again, inshallah. Absolutely. Um, to connect it to the talk, um, John, the five pillars in and of themselves when we talk about emptying, um, each one of them, if we go through them, it's almost like a rubric and a training manual for every single one of us to be able to move from um, this idea of fixing, talking, giving solutions, giving advice to just being and sitting. So if we take from the Shahada, we talked, again, scratch the surface of witnessing. What does it mean to witness another person in their pain and in their suffering? Witnessing is not talking over them or at them. Witnessing is being able to take in everything that they're going through and just being that solid anchor for them to be that compassionate presence. When we talk about salah, what does it mean to be in hudur, to be in full presence in salah when we are completely silent, right? We are completely still. That you know, excessive movement of the body is, is discouraged for a reason. Um, uh, when we talk about um, fasting, right, uh, this idea of abstaining from something, what does it look like for us to abstain from platitudes, to abstain, 
to control ourselves from responding or listening just to respond. So we begin to engage, in other words, I hope that we're getting the sense of beginning to engage these rituals that we're doing on a daily, monthly, annually, lifetime level where Allah is literally preparing us to be this best version of ourselves, where we can show up for people um, in the way that they need us, which is this, this compassionate, gentle, and it brings us back to this humility as well. That's why I emphasize that humbling of the ego. We don't walk in with our assumptions and judgments of like, I know exactly what you need. I'm just tell you. Um, it's being open and curious to new experiences, even with the same people who we see day after day because we begin to see them as a reflection of Allah Ta'ala. We begin to see them as Allah, Allah sent, right, to our doorstep. I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Zak Lakhair Sundus, um, for these beautiful uh, answers and for you all for asking these beautiful uh, questions. This has absolutely been a, a really blessed and sacred gathering, especially in, in these questions and this interaction here. Um, what I just want to uh, remind you all as we conclude today, uh, the conversation doesn't have to stop here. Uh, please do go out uh, and uh, uh, and see Chaplain Sundus's writings. You can follow her on Instagram. Uh, I just dropped the uh, handle on in the chat, and you can take a look at her book. Uh, Dr. Safi's holding up uh, musings for Muslim, uh, musings uh, of a Muslim chaplain, um, and we will, like I said, we'll we have raffled it. And we'll send it all to those who were selected. Um, but please uh, do go and support her uh, and 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 get a copy of that book. It's truly just a uh, a work of art and just a work of just blessing. And uh, Chaplain Sundus, again, we really appreciate you coming to our space blessing the space and seeing your posts come to life and seeing the embodied uh, <laughs> presence here has really been absolutely blessing. So um, thank you. The uh, honor is all mine and gratitude is all mine. Thank you to Chaplain Osama and Muslim Space for having me, truly. Absolutely. We're most, most blessed to do so. And I would like to invite you all back, inshallah, for our final halakha uh, next uh, month in December 16th. Uh, it's again, the third Thursday of December. We're still trying to uh, get a topic uh, and speaker uh, uh, locked down, but inshallah, uh, we will be having that to announce soon. Uh, and if you want to keep up with Muslim Space, please visit our website at muslimspace.org. We'd love to have you be a part of our community, whether embodied or virtually. Uh, inshallah, we'll keep the conversation going. But we have uh, Chaplain Sundus's uh, handle there for you. Please, again, uh, check it out, follow her, give and uh, give a shout out um, to, to this incredible halakha. And inshallah, we will we will just put a pause on the conversation, friends. We're not ending it here. Put a pause on it, and we'll continue it at another time. But Sundos, again, thank you so much, inshallah. Uh, we really look forward to having you back, and we're looking forward to con uh, continuing the conversation, inshallah. Allah, inshallah. Thank you, guys. Assalamu alaikum. Have a good night. Everybody, you as well. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Jazakallah khair for coming.